the Democratic Party decided um, decades ago that they did not want to be the party of the working class any longer. They wanted to be the party of a different class, uh, a group that they refer to as the creative class, uh, which is uh, winners in the new economy. Uh, that's who they are, that's how they see themselves, that's who they speak to. One of the reasons they did that is because they thought that the working class had nowhere else to go. This is an expression we use in American politics, oh, meaning they can't go over to the other side. Well, <laughs> guess what happened? Well, while they were doing that, the Republican Party, which is the party of the right in America, decided to, or tried to reach out to uh, disaffected, angry, working class people uh, using a bunch of different techniques, uh, using the culture wars, you know, talking about their values and stuff like that, using religion, uh, using uh, racial issues, and now with Trump uh, actually talking about economic issues. And uh, so over the years, this problem has just become worse and worse and worse. And what, of, of course, the Republican Party, which now wins the, you know, the majority of the votes of the white working class, never does anything to actually help them out. Uh, because they, what they really believe in is, of course, markets, uh, lower taxes, rolling back regulations, making the rich richer. And so it's a, um, it's a disastrous situation politically in America where no one really uh, does anything for working people anymore. And instead we have you know, these demagogues like Donald Trump you know, who get their votes and then pass gigantic tax cuts. And then on the other hand, we have Democrats who uh, call them names like deplorables and, which is what Hillary Clinton called Trump supporters, and, uh, and, and, and does you know, great favors for Wall Street. Professionals is the way of describing the, 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 the people who are the most, uh, uh, you know, the most democratic group in America. Well, these are very affluent, rich people. Uh, they have advanced degrees, um, they're white collar workers. I live in a neighborhood that's filled with these kind of people, and they, are very, they can be very liberal on uh, social issues and cultural issues. However, they are not liberal at all on issues having to do with work, uh, income, uh, pay, inequality, you know, anything having to do with, say, uh, labor unions. Their number one value is meritocracy. Meritocracy, the idea that the people who are on top in society are up there because they deserve it. And the reason they deserve it is because they did so well in school. And this is the sort of, uh, this has become the dogma of the Democratic Party. For people who don't do well in school, the uh, uh, meritocracy has nothing but contempt. Just utter contempt for the people at the bottom. I call them names. You know, there's a debate right now in the Democratic Party as to whether or not they should try to reach out to Trump voters, people that voted for Trump, which just seems insane to me. It's like, of course you want to win the votes of people. You know, you want a majority, right? That's what you want to do. But uh, it's like those people are tainted. Those people are damaged goods because they're not uh, winners. Now, another consequence of being a party of uh, the professional class is that you fill, you know, you fill the, you look at the administration of Barack Obama, or you look at the administration of Bill Clinton, or you look at the people that advised Hillary Clinton. Um, and it's always people from, you know, with a, a very impressive academic pedigrees. Do you know what I mean by that? With fancy degrees from fancy uh, institutions, uh, you know, a lot of Rhodes Scholars, um, a lot of people who went to Harvard, uh, that sort of thing. That's always who they surround themselves with. And in one sense, this is, this is a good thing, right? You want smart people in government. But on the other hand, there's this incredible um, danger to it. And the danger is just this, that the people at the top in government will look, look at the people at the top on Wall Street and the people at the top in Big Pharma or the people at the top in Silicon Valley and they identify with them. They see them as peers and they do incredible favors for them. Uh, they, you know, they, they, uh, the guys at the Treasury Department look at the guys on Wall Street and say, well, you know, they're just like, I went to school with those guys. 
They're just like, they're just like me. They didn't mean to do it. You know, this, I'm talking about the financial crisis, this sort of economic catastrophe that we inflicted on you and the rest of the world. And, uh, and you're welcome for that, by the way. <laughs> but uh, but, it, but the, the Treasury Department looks at these guys and they say, you know, they're good guys. They meant well. They didn't mean to cause a global <laughs> economic catastrophe. They just made one little mistake. So let's, let's let them off the hook. But when they look at people at the bottom who did some small crime uh, in the housing in the housing bubble, like uh, lied on a mortgage application, which is very common in America, in fact was encouraged 10 years ago in America, they, uh, they put those people in jail, you know, for the smallest little crime. But the Wall Street guys, you know, who lied to the entire world and sold the entire world, you know, fraudulent financial instruments that were designed to ex blow up in your face, um, those people are, uh, you know, hey, those, those are your friends from... MIT or Stanford or whatever. This is the age of inequality. I mean, I, uh, I was born in 1965 in a country that was, America has never had the kind of robust welfare state that you had in France, but we were in effect a social democracy in the sense that there was not a great distance between working people and managers, between blue collar and white collar. That's just who we were when in the country that I was born into. They called it the middle class democracy. We were the great middle class nation. Everybody had a car. Some people had a Chevy. Some people had a Buick. But that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between them. You know, and we all lived in the suburbs together. And that was the country I was born into. That country is gone. And that is the great issue of the last 50 years is the coming of inequality. That the middle class society has come apart. And now, you know, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Kansas, and if you drive around the part of the country that I uh, came from, the small towns are in ruins, you know, the factories are empty, the people that used to work in them are uh, in despair, I mean, they're angry, they're bitter. The, the Democrats, in the course of my lifetime, have become a party that is uncomfortable with discontent with class-based anger. They don't like to talk about it. It makes them uncomfortable. Whenever they hear it, they try to get around it. They try to throw roadblocks in front of the cognitive roadblocks. They don't want to think about it. Uh, it you know, it, they can't stand the idea. I wrote a book uh, 15 years ago called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it's about how, uh, uh, it's about blue collar conservatism. It's about working class people uh, voting for right wing politicians, which was, not exactly a new phenomenon at the time, but anyhow, so I wrote this book. And um, the, the reaction from Democrats was to say, that's not happening. That is simply not, not happening. Now, after Donald Trump, they can't say that anymore. I mean, obviously it, it's happening. It's, it's gone very far. So they come up with other ways of denying it. They say, well, you know, Trump didn't really win rightfully. He cheated. Uh, the Russians helped him out, you know, this, that, and the other. They, they cannot acknowledge what is incredibly obvious to anyone that looks at an electoral map in America, which is that Dem Democrats are now the party of uh, prosperous people. And that Republicans, uh, a party that I disagree with and in fact can't stand, um, that is filled with uh, demagogues and charlatans and liars like Donald Trump, that the Republicans have managed to capture the votes of the, of the Democratic Party's old constituents. This is incredibly painful for them and they can't look it in the face. For them to, to, uh, to admit that this is happening would mean for them to go back to their own triumph, Hil the, the triumph of Hillary's generation, the triumph of Hillary's social class, and to say, that was all a mistake. Trump did a number of things that were new for a Republican and that was the most important one. Uh, NAFTA was the first of the big uh, trade agreements in America. And I don't know if you know the history, it was um, written by Republicans by Reagan and Bush Sr., by their administrations, but they couldn't get it passed through Congress. So Republicans traditionally believe in these agreements. By the way, a NAFTA is not a free trade agreement. It's an agreement that protects American investment in Mexico. And uh, it was written deliberately as a way to uh, break the power of organized labor. Okay, it was written with that purpose. And uh, so organized labor was against it. The Democratic Party was against it. But Bill Clinton, 
who became president in 1993, he got it done. It was one of the first things he did as president. He got it done. He got a Republican trade agreement passed, and sure enough, it had the effect of destroying organized labor in America. And then he passed a whole bunch of other trade agreements that did the same thing. And so NAFTA has been, for um, workers in America, has been the moment of betrayal. So they look back, they re everybody remembers that. And one of the reasons they remember it is because um, bosses in America bring it up at every negotiation. Every time they negotiate a contract with the union or with their workers, they're like, well, you know, if you don't agree to this, we're going to close the, the factory and move it to Mexico. They do this. This is, we know the numbers on this. It's like 90% of the time. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it happens always. And every, uh, you know, industrial worker in America knows this. And they still hate Bill Clinton because of it. Okay, so here comes Donald Trump. And he starts a attacking NAFTA and attacking uh, uh, these trade agreements. Again, Republicans never do this. So this was, uh, first of all, he was able to beat all these other Republicans, 17 Republicans who had much more political experience, you know, much more money, like you're talking about the, the Bush family here. He beat them using this issue and a couple of others. Where, uh, and then he beat Hillary Clinton with it. And... Uh, I think it was the perfect issue for beating Hillary Clinton because uh, she couldn't get out of it because her name is Clinton. She, she tried to get out of it. She'd say, oh, you know, I, I agree with some of that. And, you know, <laughs> you know she'd be all mealy-mouthed about it. But she could, not, she could not escape this issue. And had it been any other Democrat, it probably wouldn't have been as, um, as devastating.